fellas, thank you for joining me on this one. I got some men up here that I admire uh, individually, even starting from Duke. You know, we know the personal conversations we've had about wealth, generating wealth. Um, George, follow you heavy. Somebody else I admire um, when it comes down to their financial intellect. So thank you for being here as well. And Trey, you know, we talk about money all the time, man. So I had to have you on the segment. Um, so today we're talking about money, right? We're talking about wealth. We're going to get into a little bit about why African-Americans lack the generational wealth uh, that we desire, right? And so a little toss-up question. Why do we lack in the category of generational wealth? Trey. Right. So let's take the obvious. Part of the reason why we lack in generational wealth is because for years we built this country and we got nothing for it, right? We understand that, right? Uh, but the other portion of that is there's a lot of education that's just not talked about at our dinner table. And it's not taught in schools. So the conversations about how we can take the money that we do have and help turn it into something that could become generational wealth it's just not happening. So, George. Yeah, to piggyback off of his uh, answer, uh, the, the truth of the matter is you got to look at the reality of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And, and a lot of people in our culture, for, for systemic reasons and a lot of other reasons, um, you know, have been in survival mode, right, for so long. And so when you're in survival mode, you can't really focus on anything beyond what's right in front of you, right? So, I think that's that's the first reality. And then beyond that, to his point, the, the lack of education, uh, all of the systemic reasons, uh, I think just has created a perfect storm for black people not being able to be in position to build wealth. I do think we're at an inflection point where we're seeing a lot more education, a lot more resources, uh, a new black renaissance, if you will, when it comes to building wealth. Um, but I think the key to making that shift is really rooted in mindset. Right, and believing that you're worthy of wealth. And so I think as we continue to lean into that, we'll see a shift. Absolutely. Duke, where think, are we lacking, my brother? I think these brothers pretty much hit it on the head, but just an addendum. It's hard to tell someone who has been taught their whole lives that they have no intrinsic value that you can accrue and acquire value. So they put it on their bodies versus in their minds. Okay. Right? And so one of those things we see a lot of people, I mean, I'm not gonna hold you, I'm rocking a belt right now. It's, you, know, it's, it's, <laughs> you feel me? But at the end of the day, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna you know, put on for any particular brand, but nevertheless, we put these things on thinking that it gives us a particular status, right? So these status symbols for individuals who believe they have no intrinsic value, give them value. So when we shift the mentality stating that, yo, you in and of yourself are the valuable being, or you are the value, now we change the whole thought process. Right, because there's nothing wrong with having a Louis belt or a you Gucci belt. It's just all about managing your priorities, right? Exactly. And I think sometimes when it comes to us as a community, the priorities is the biggest challenge that we deal with when it comes down to generational wealth. And one thing for sure that I've learned amongst my journey is that generational wealth is going to take sacrifice, right? So we can talk about one key piece already. So research shows that ethnicities outside of people of color have what you call intergenerational wealth, which means that the generational wealth that they actually have is circulating in their family. And one of the biggest ways that they do that is life insurance policies. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk a little bit about life insurance policies and the conversations we don't like to have about death as a community. George. Yeah, so that's, that's a really good point. Um, obviously, life insurance is one of the most efficient ways to pass down wealth. Right. Um, but I think even deeper than that, you have to pass down the mindset and the methodology and not just the money, right? Because we've seen time and time again where, you know, the money gets passed down, right. right? But there's no understanding 
and no structure, the financial no trust, literacy. no will, no, no things in place that really help them understand how, what to do, right? So in the context of life insurance, I mean, I, I look at it no different than passing down a house or passing down, um, you know, an investment account. At the end of the day, you're going to get this infusion of capital, but if you don't have the mindset on what to do with it, you're going to squander. Right. right. So life insurance is great. It is efficient. I mean, for when you look at the dollars and cents on what it costs you to pass down a million, two million dollars, just I mean, there's no no better vehicle. But I think the conversation has to extend beyond that and say, okay, well, why did we get the policy in the first place? What are we gonna do with the money once we get it? And then how do we keep it going? Because the reality is we keep using this term of generational wealth, but nobody wants to hold on to assets for longer than a generation. Mm, that's key. Right? Everybody wants to spend the money today, right? Make no mistake about it. Like my man said, you got the belt on, you know, I'm, you know, I, I like nice stuff too, but my priorities are in the right place, mm -hmm. right? So you got to put your priorities in the right place. And, and truth be told, the best way to pass down generational wealth is to be that example. So I have a four month year old son. Shout out to Legend. He's not here, but shout out to my son. Shout out to Legend, man. Clap it up. Go. Um, and the best example I can give him is through my actions. Right. So when he grows up and he can start absorbing a little bit more and see him how I'm moving. Right. Everybody's from the show me state. Right. And so the best thing you can do is show your kids, show your family what it looks like. The reason why people gravitate towards being athletes or entertainers, of course, we're seeing a shift now. People want to be entrepreneurs as well is because they're gravitating towards what they see. Right. And so you got to be that change. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest component of generational wealth. I, I agree with him wholeheartedly. So to answer your question, life insurance is very important. I don't know why we're so afraid to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a great way to pass down that wealth. And even in my friend circle, it's funny, you know, there's a lot of us who are just now getting it. And we're afraid to talk about, well, what happens to us when we die? Mm -hmm. For me personally, I got a wife. I don't have any kids yet, but I want to make sure she's good mm -hmm. when I die. So it's okay to talk about it, go get it. But the other thing he talked about, uh, the other thing that he talked about was what you got to understand what to do with money when you have it or it's just going to get squandered. And the greatest example of that uh, is, I mean, there's people out there who think I'll be able to figure it out when I got a bunch of money. Mm. Well, I can tell you right now, <laughs> in my circle, there are several people who make hundreds of thousands of dollars and they're still broke. Mm. And the reason why is because there's no education about what to do with that money, how to turn that money into wealth. On the flip side, there's people who, and I'm apologize right now for my sister, I'm about to put a business out there. There's people like my sister who have never made six figures, and yet she's one of the wealthiest people I know. How did that happen? What decisions did she make to get her to that point? And why is it that it's hard for us to understand that wealth doesn't have to look a particular way. You can't see somebody's net worth when they walk into a room. Absolutely. So, dude. I mean, again, these brothers didn't hit the nail on the head, right? Um, it ain't about what you make, it's about what you keep, right? And so the modalities we have with financial planning and you know, getting with a spouse who understands that it's about the longevity, it's not about the two year space, where you're able to do what you want to do, travel, make it look good. This ain't Instagram. You feel what I'm saying? This is real <laughs> life. You feel what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, if your kids, 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 kids aren't good, then what are you really doing? No, I, I think, George, what you said is setting the example, right? Mm. Being, being a walking example of what generational wealth is. Um, setting the example because we all know that, especially as African-Americans, we're big visual learners which is why we love social media, right? We're downloading. As you swiping and you scrolling, you seeing cars, houses, fashion, all those different things. And sometimes we may have misconceived notions about what wealth is, and especially what's wealth in our community. And sometimes it's a shame that we have to look at how a different ethnic group handles wealth to bring back into our community and say, this is how we should be doing it. Because let's be honest, some of the most successful people that we know, we technically don't know, but they rappers, ball players, and other things. 
But like George, like what you were saying, there's a shift now in the universe when it comes down to being an entrepreneur is actually a thing now. It's cool to be an entrepreneur. It's cool to get your LLC. It's cool to get your S Corp. It's cool to get your life insurance. Um, just to shout out another podcast, like I'm a big fan of Earn Your Leisure. Yes, I love the content yes, that sir. they put out because they break down financial literacy in layman's terms. And sometimes that's what's needed to learn, right? Do. So delayed gratification is something that we aren't necessarily truly comfortable with, right? So all of us want, again, like Trey said, we're all in survival mode. Many people operate within that survival mode. I got to eat today. I got to make sure I got food on the table tomorrow so my kids X, Y, and Z. Whereas we're not thinking, how can I allow my kids to think along the lines of benefiting themselves 10 years from now? Mm -hmm. So it's the delayed gratification that we need to truly inculcate within our communities, right? And we can't do that unless we're having those table talks, right? Me and Trey were talking about it earlier, man. It's a matter of just sitting down with your people and having those conversations at the dinner table. Exactly. You see what I'm saying? What are you doing with the money that you just got? I gave you a stipend for whatever reason. I gave you an allowance. How are you reinvesting that X, Y, and Z? Tell me what your plan is. We got to normalize talking about money. Come on yeah. now. Like Jamel Hill. Jamel Hill said it um, on Earn Your Leisure's podcast about how it's important for the women in ESPN anchors to talk about how much money they make. Come on. Because it's important as a woman going into business with ESPN to make sure that you don't get shorted. Right. But if we're as a community, if we're not talking about money and we everything is a secret and you think everybody's trying to count your pockets, you're never going to be able to grow. Right. You're always going to have a glass ceiling. You're always going to be limited. George, go ahead. Yeah. And I think there has to be a redefinition of what wealth is. Mm -hmm. Right. You have because to redefine it. Riches is measured in money. Wealth is measured in time. Right. And what, I, and what I mean by that good. is if I can't be present for my son, if I can't be present for my wife, if I can't do what I want to do, when I want to do it, for however long I want to do it, for whoever I want to, whoever I want to do it with, I'm not wealthy. Right. So we got to redefine what wealth means. It's not these tangible things that we can see. Right. Because at the end, at the end of the day, wealth really is uh, an unexercised option. Right. It's what you don't see. And that's why it's so hard to learn about wealth. Because the reason why I'm wealthy is because I have the capital reserves, the assets that you might not be able to see. It's not tangible, but it's giving me the leverage and the power to live life on my own terms. So we have to do a better job at redefining what wealth is so that people aren't, oh, let me go buy that car. Let me go buy that house. Let me go buy that watch. But now I got to work over and over and over again to keep up the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know, so people got cars parked in their garage. <laughs> and when you look at what they're paying for the car, Five, right? Six, I always, right? I always tell people, especially when I do talks with like kids and stuff, it's like when you when you spend money on something, you're trading hours of your life, right? The cost of anything is the amount of life you're willing to trade for. That's the cost of it, right? So when you start doing the math, that six hundred dollar car payment, that twenty five hundred dollar mortgage, whatever it is. It's not twenty five hundred dollars. It's not six hundred dollars. It's so many hours of your life, mm -hmm. right? And when you start to calculate it like that, you'll start to have a paradigm shift about what real wealth is. And Trey, I'm gonna let you go. It sounds like for me, even having this conversation, uh, a word that's synonymous with wealth is freedom. Yes. So having the freedom to travel, having the freedom to bless your family with money, having the freedom to say, you know what, I want to take the week off and not have to worry about the finances or answering to somebody. So it's not saying that it's not okay not to have a nine to five, right. but you don't want to also be a slave to it, right? It's, a, it's indicative to how you eat and how you live, but freedom is synonymous with wealth. Right, Trey. So I'll just say this. Duke said something earlier about the conversation we were having outside. And one of the things that really helped me and changed my perspective on wealth, changed my perspective on uh, where I was in life, was just realizing, one, it's okay to talk about it. Everybody talks about money like it's taboo. If you follow me, I do not care about talking about money. <laughs> and I want to share that information with everybody because I don't want to be the only person with money. It's no right. fun when you're the only person as well, right? Right. Just, being, just saying. Um, but the other thing that I had to realize is I don't need to be embarrassed 
about where I was, right? Because I got to a different place now, but don't need to be embarrassed because statistically, in this room, most of us are in the exact same situation. Right. So why are we afraid to talk about it? Having those conversations, talking to people like this man right here, learning from people like this man right here, who's like actually certified to do it, that, that helps you, that, that's a game changer. And when you're not afraid to have those conversations, you start to realize there's little things I can do right now that can impact my overall wealth. Absolutely. One of them, like I just said, is talk about it. The other one is start saving. Everybody thinks I gotta have a lot of money to start the saving. Right. First of all, there's a bunch of different ways you can save. You know, I, I definitely believe in savings accounts and, and he'll probably tell you you need to try and save up a couple of months, right, of your expenses. But saving also is finding a job with a 401k that mm -hmm. adds money to your 401k and basically is giving you free money for what you put in. Magic. A lot of people don't realize employee that. Match. It's magic. That employee match. And then watching that just compound and grow. Oh my gosh, it's so it's so amazing. I love looking at my account every now and then. It's a refresh. And I'm like, <laughs> all that money right there is cool, but a lot of that was given to me for free for showing up to work. A lot of people don't take advantage of a program like that. And they think it's gonna impact them more than it really, that it's gonna take away more from their bottom line than it really does. Right. Right? It's still your money. It's still your money. Still to, your money. To, add, to add to that, bro, like how we manage our healthcare. Not too many people know about health savings accounts and high deductible insurances, where you can make way at the end of the year with those taxes to be taxed at a different bracket for whatever it is you got going on. Again, it's not about how much you make, but how much you keep. Not about how much you keep. You see what George, it's found on your platform with Melanin Money and what you're teaching with your financial literacy. <laughs> yeah, uh, so Melanin Money uh, originally actually started out as an e-commerce brand because uh, I have a registered investment advisory firm and I was like, how can I just create more awareness of what I'm doing? I was like, well, I don't want to buy a billboard, but if people wear t-shirts, they can kind of see like what it's about. And so we evolved that into a financial social network called the Melanin Millionaires Club. And our goal is to help 100,000 people over the next 10 years achieve their first 1 million in net worth. I like right? that. I that's like a, that's key. That's our objective. Like where, where can they find some information on that? Real quick. Again? Where can they find some information? Yeah, so go to melaninmoney.com forward slash join. You'll see all the context on what the club is all about. Um, and really, it's just broken down into five key pillars, right? It's number one is income allocation. Right? I don't care whether you make 50000 or 500000 if you're not allocating a, a, a decent enough percentage to saving, investing, getting out of debt, then you know, I think it was an article that went out earlier this week about people making a quarter million dollars living check to check or something, right? So yeah. income allocation is the first pillar. How can I strategically allocate more money to the goals that I have? Uh, pillar number two is personal finance, right? How am I managing the money that's coming in more effectively, right? Pillar number three is risk management. Right. How can I protect myself against unforeseen circumstances? Right. What if I get hurt? What if I get sick? What if I die prematurely? Talk about life insurance. Pillar number four is the one that's most attractive as well. Building. Am I maxing out that that 401k? Right. Am I do I have recurring contributions set up to a brokerage account? Things of that nature. Do I have uh, a passive income stream that I'm developing? Right. And then last but not least, uh, pillar number five is legacy and legal. Right? Because if we want to make sure that we're transitioning this wealth and structuring it the right way, we got to do it. So that's, that is our kind of our roadmap. That's how we do it. Um, my goal, again, anybody, I actually got some friends in here who I went to college with, so I can tell you, I've, been, I've had this message for 10 plus years, right? Um, and one of the key things in this journey is you got to be mindful of who you're listening to. There's a lot of people in this world who they're trying to come up off of this whole black excellence renaissance right. way. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? It's like, and now every, everybody's an expert now. Where are they at now when the markets are down? Where are all the crypto gurus? Mm -hmm. Where are all the stock market gurus now? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I've been here for 10, 10 years <laughs> talking about the same thing, yeah. right? So be, be mindful about who you're listening to because that's going to be probably one of the key things that help you move in the right direction. So that's what the Melanin Money uh, team is all about. And if anybody wants to tap in, uh, definitely go to melaninmoney.com for us. Clap it up for Melanin Money, man. Melanin Money. Y'all absolutely need to be following this man and following his platforms. One of the things I want to expound upon that he said, though, is when you're talking about building wealth, my opinion, I think that the real, the only way to really build wealth is to realize the value in assets, right? 
And I think a lot of times, people for good reason, they don't understand things like the market. They don't understand things like how their 401k works. And so sometimes they shy away from those things. But I can tell you right now, all my friends who are putting money under their mattress, or putting money in a savings account, <laughs> or feeling it this year, because as inflation grew, they got a lot broken, right? Whereas the people who had invested in the market, when the market was doing well, their wealth grows. And if you look at the S&P 500, which you should definitely talk about more so with somebody like them, <laughs> for the past, like, what, 100 years, it's been 10% on average? So you're telling me that on average, I could possibly get a 10% year-over-year return on my money? Why wouldn't I want a piece of that? And when I started thinking like that, look, don't get me wrong, we got a problem with the amount of money that CEOs make and the way that companies operate. I agree with you on that. But I don't get as upset at Jeff Bezos as some other people because when Jeff Bezos gets richer, so do I. Right. Because I own a piece of Jeff Bezos' company. Right. So when everybody's like, wow, I don't like how much money this CEO is making, or Facebook is making, or Apple is making, I'm sitting there like, eh, it ain't so bad. Right. Because you know, I'm making it too. So right. One thing that you said is key. I heard Billy Carson say the other day. A lot of times as a community, we complain about things that we participate in, right? So we complain about capitalism, but we participate in capitalism. So if you complain about capitalism, but you invest in your 401k, your 401k is an example of capitalism in this country. Some countries don't have a, don't, you can't actively uh, participate in the market. You can be in a communist country, right? So the fact that we have this luxury to invest in things that we choose to is actually a choice that we can make daily, right? But Duke, I have a question for you. How do we, breaking it down, how do we actually reprogram our consciousness to think about wealth? It's, yo, know, the wild part is I was trying to figure out a decent segue to say this colloquialism, but scared money don't make money, mm -hmm. right? And so as we both state, as, as Trey stated, as my man Achim Pong stated, when you're in the market, things are going to go left, right? But Warren Buffett is a great example. Double down when it gets red, when it starts to bleed. Don't run from it because a lot of people jump in when things are only going well, mm -hmm. right? And then they get scared and sell. They panic sell when things are going left, right? When you see chaos, that's when you invest, right? Mm -hmm. When you see things become quote unquote, scary, for lack of a better phrase, that's when you take whatever you have and put that down on something that could become an asset, right? And that's how you start to see yourself building well. Absolutely. Right? And Trey, what would you say the first step is that someone should do in this situation? Let's say they, they leave today and they say, you know what, I want to be a lot more conscious about building wealth. Is it there are three months of savings. Is it paying down debt? Is it investing in the stock split on Monday? What is it that they should do the first thing to secure their wealth? The okay, first thing you need to do is follow this man. So that's the first thing. <laughs> Somebody license. Facts. Look, so I, I'm glad you asked. I actually got these steps in. So the first thing, follow somebody like him and start talking about it. Find somebody you trust and start talking about it. Make a plan. Because you can't go nowhere without an actual plan. Mm -hmm. The second thing is start saying That's going to have to happen. There was someone who mentioned delayed gratification. I gotta tell you, I, when my wife and I, when we were looking to buy our first home, we weren't in the financial situation that we're in right now, right? So we had to, for a year and a half, literally not do anything fun. I'm talking anything fun. We didn't go on trips. We didn't go to movies. We didn't go out to eat. We didn't buy anything Trey, you too loud. I'm just saying, <laughs> too loud, and, right. and it too was loud. a year and a half. And when we tell people that, some people get it. Some people look at it it's like, dang, that's, I don't know. I'm like a year and a half to be able to buy a home, which now is an asset that has literally doubled in value almost, you know, as far as the equity. So start saving and figuring out what that looks like for you. The next thing for me, and this is something that you can talk to him about. I think you need to start saving and figuring out how can you get that home? Because for a lot of people, owning property is a big part of their wealth. 
And we've seen how the game is going right now, man. If you own a house and you own one before this pandemic happened, the equity that you have in it is phenomenal. And on paper, your net worth is phenomenal. If you stayed in that house for like 30 years and passed away and left it to your kids, oh my gosh, it's amazing. And then after that, I'd be looking, how can I get into the market? What can I do next? So I'll pass that question on to someone else. George. Yeah. Um, so the first thing is, what you appreciate, appreciates. Mm-hmm. And, what I, and what I mean by that That's is, a bar. you are your first investment. Right. So I appreciate the acknowledgement about following me and tapping in and learning as you can. But like, if there's things that intrigue you, if there's things that interest you, right, go deeper, right? Learn because when you acquire that knowledge, you and you now have that intrinsic value to become more valuable. You are an asset, right? So the first thing is invest in yourself. I know people say that and that sounds so cliche, but you invest in something because you believe it's going to appreciate. So if you invest in yourself, Right. Absolutely. So it's self-explanatory. So that 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 would be the first thing. And the other thing is just a, a shift in mindset to realize that the quicker you get to your dream life, the longer you get to enjoy it. Mm. Right. So people are so they're shunning this delayed gratification or the, the year that it's going to take to stay down or six months, or whatever. But the quicker you do that, the longer period of time you have to enjoy it. And the last thing I'll say is uh, understanding the difference between equity and compensation, mm-hmm. right? You don't Let's have to be an entrepreneur to build wealth, right? Yes. I am. I've been one for a decade, yes. right? But you don't have to be. But you do have to be an owner, mm. right? You don't have to be an entrepreneur, but you have to be an owner. What I mean by that, you have to own things like homes. You have to own investments in the stock market, right? And, and maybe even own equity in a business that you own but don't run, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's like I get... I have equity ownership in it. I might, I might be getting a check from it, even though I'm not running the day-to-day operation. Mm-hmm. You got to make that shift from owner, uh, from compensation to equity, because equity is going to be the thing that creates sustainable wealth. Compensation is that paycheck that you get for the time that you trade for the skill you provide. Right. So when you make that transition, that's how you build wealth. Right. When things can pay you, even when you're not trading time. Oh, that's key, man, because. Essentially, what you're saying is very similar to the book uh, Millionaire Next Door. It's being able to look at these profiles of millionaires in that they are everyday people, right? John and Susie's house is paid off, but it's worth $800,000, right? They have a million dollars in their 401k. It's just looking at those two assets, they're worth $1.8 million, but they may not have the Mercedes Benz and the Louis Vuitton and all these other different things. Not saying that something is wrong with those things, but you can tell that John and Susie prioritize wealth sometime in their life. And it's also too, sometimes we live, we have this, um, this mindset as a community that money is automatically just passed down. Millions of dollars is passed down to our white friends or our white coworkers, right? But a lot of times when you sit down and talk to them, they have similar beginnings as we had, right? But at the end of the day, the thing that they have over us a lot of times is the education and the discipline, being able to actually apply the things that we learn. And that's major key. Go ahead, Duke. Nah, man, you hit the nail on Again, y'all are all saying everything that I would say. It's just Mm -hmm. a matter of game planning, right? You have to know, you have to start with the end in mind. Right, I like a book called Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Man, mm-hmm. listen. Repeat that, that book, book again. Start With Why by Simon Sinek. There's this thing called the golden circle, right? You have what you do, you have how you do it, and then you have the central piece of that circle, which is why you do it, right? That piece, why, is the key to the success of Apple, Amazon, Google, all these major companies that we see now that everybody's talking about stock splits and investing in. They have a why, a culture that is built in, right? And that, is, that culture is what people invest in. Going back to it, again, you can't be scared to see that red. When that red hits, that's when you double down and go forward. Absolutely. And I, and I just want to say, like, the idea that wealth is built overnight can end up being misleading for a lot of people. And I think that discourages a lot of people. For me personally, Wealth was built with a lot of small decisions that added up over time. For instance, 
That sounds like discipline to me, bro. Is that discipline? Is that what you're talking about? That's discipline. That's discipline. And realizing that I'm not going at this for the home run. I've got to make a lot of small decisions over time that when you add up all the decisions, they significantly pay off. But you got to start. Got to get in the game. Once you're in the game, it's a... like a snowball effect, you know, as you, it's a positive snowball effect. As you keep doing those things, the snowball gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Absolutely. Hey, Lyle, I got a question for you, and I want you to pose this to the audience. What is excellence? What is assets? Excellence. Excellence. Essence? Excellence. 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 Am I, am I, is my English we got, some, we got some feedback. What is excellence? Excellence. Um, I would say for me, excellence is the ability to do something continuously that you love and exude that to the people around you and they buy it into what you have. What you so like I use Black Fly on the Wall as an example. Everybody that's on the team sees how hard I work in the background. So for Duke or Trey, this is his second go around. It's easy for me to hit him two weeks ago and say, Trey, can you be on the show? Because you understand the work that someone puts in. And I think that's sometimes what's missing, right? The consistency, the hard work, the stuff that's not pretty, the stuff that people don't want to do, right? It's the things that you have to continuously grind, staying up late, missing sleep, stress, managing stress, delegating, being humble. All of that is excellence, in my opinion, all right? And I, one thing I want to do before we leave, before we close this one out, book recommendations. What is a book? about financial literacy that shifted your whole mindset. For me, and I'm just finished reading it for the second time, is Richest Man in Babylon, mm, right? That's that book, book continued, that book shifted my entire mindset and broke down simple things like paying yourself a tenth of what you make, right? So understanding simple, simple uh, financial literacy, it helped me learn about money. What is a book that changed your mindset? It's two books. A lot of people probably say these same two books, but they were big for me. Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Of course. Of and course. Millionaire Next Door. Millionaire Next Door. There's man. a lot of billionaires who live in your neighborhood who you look at and you're like, ah, they go to work every day. They can't be a millionaire. Bro, they probably, they may they probably are. They, exactly. George. He took, he took one of mine, uh, respectfully. Uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, for sure. Uh, for my investors who really want to understand the fundamentals of the market, uh, the intelligent investor. Oh, I got that. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a meaty read, but it's yes. a really good book. Yes. And Duke, what's so another for book? For me, I already stated one. Start with Why by Simon Sinek and right. The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. Tipping Point. Both of those books will tell you about the psychology behind success. Mm-hmm. Once you get the psychology, aka the framework of mind, everything else flows. Absolutely. And man, this was an amazing segment, man. Uh, clap it up. Having African Americans having a conversation about wealth, I think is major key. Um, I think as more and more as we continue to talk about wealth, it plants seeds into your subconscious, right? You're downloading all this positive, high level conversation here, and it's gonna push you, right? So follow Melanin Money, follow Trey McQueen, follow Two Stacks, Dr. Duke OKK, all right? Thank you all for tapping in.